Well, well, it turns out, now I've locked the taskbar so it stays on screen. I don't know if I'll be able to use it, but I'll try. It turns out just before or after I exited this, you know, the last video, I found this. Look at this. The, it's on the same disc. The Book of Job. Look, essays and what does it say? Metrical paraphrase. They call it a paraphrase because in a way you are. It's not a literal translation. If you're trying to, you're just copying the syllables, you might have to use different English words that are slightly different from the meaning in the Hebrew. And this is done by Rossiter Raymond, Ph.D. Metrical paraphrase. Now watch, watch, watch. This guy's a scholar. Hello, hello, hello. With an introductory note by a guy named Conan. Okay, from the American Bible Union. That's pretty scholarly, don't you think? Metrical paraphrase. And this isn't the Psalms anymore, honey. This is the book of Job. And what year is this? Kill yourself right now. See? 1878. So let's have a look at what this guy intends to do. Oh, I hate these... They have too many blank pages in these things. Author's preface. That's important. Members of the adult Bible class of Plymouth Church, Brooklyn, New York. At whose request this book has been made published will need no explanation as to its origin and nature. Brooklyn. You know what Brooklyn is. This is where a lot of Jews congregated and still are today. But it's the Bible class of Plymouth Church. The Plymouth Brethren Okay, Dispies, Dispensationalists, you know, they made the Darby translation. Or not necessarily these people, but th their sister churches. Okay, Brooklyn, Brooklyn, New York. And whose request this book has been published will need no explanation as to its origin and nature. But, for the information of others into whose hands it may fall, some prefatory remarks. That's kind of an odd way of saying it. Some prefatory remarks seem to be required. Here we go. During the year 1877, the class referred to was engaged in, get this, the critical study of the book of Job. This portion of scripture was selected partly because it is one of those which has been most sadly abused both in translation and in exegesis. Partly because its admitted character as a work of dramatic art takes it to a great extent out of the realm of theological controversy and opens it to unprejudiced critical examination. And finally, because the result of such an examination is to shed unexpected light upon the whole theory of revelation as a history of divinely guided religions culture, religious culture. Here we go. The metrical paraphrase was prepared week by week as the class at the class. This guy was teaching the meter in class in the study of the text. This is a, I hope you got this, this is a guy with a PhD teaching his own Bible class using meter for his students. Now, I hope you understand that in the 1800s, it wasn't, you know, getting a book and reading was really revered, but it wasn't common. It was desirable. They didn't have public schools in those days. So you either learned it from your parents at home, or you paid a whole lot of money to go to school, or you hired a tutor. So this is really, really important that this guy is teaching a whole Bible class as a part of a church, not college. You got that? And he's teaching the meter, which means it was popular. You getting that? If you're teaching something in a Bible class with just your average layman in it, and you're using meter, to us today, that's a pretty sophisticated concept since none of the scholars are talking about it. But here's this guy publishing a book 
that is essentially the repeat of the classes he was teaching in the study of the text of Job. Job. Not Psalms. Job, which is a prose book. It's got a lot of literary value, but it's a prose book. Okay? And that's some kind of identifying mark for this particular book. Okay, and was presented as a convenient, the meter is considered convenient means of conveying a version more accurate in its fidelity to the thought of the original than that of the King James translators. You see, this is what happened. In the 1800s, they found a whole bunch of Bible manuscripts, Tischendorf, Tregellis, a bunch of other guys, and they started comparing the King James translation to the original manuscripts they had of the Hebrew and the Greek. And they said, you know what, we need to retranslate. King James is fine, it's venerated, everybody's familiar with it, but it's not as fidelis, it's not as loyal to the thought of the original. This is the first thing they teach you in seminary about what they call textual criticism. You are trying to apprehend the thought of the original writer. And that was all the rage and all the fad and all the fashion even in a Plymouth congregation in Brooklyn. Which, by the way, would have much easier access to the Hebrew since a whole bunch of Jews living in Brooklyn then. Okay? As English poetry, it can lay claim to no other virtue than that of Saxon simplicity. In other words, it doesn't necessarily rhyme, but it is measured. Meter means measured. So scholars who are acquainted with the translations and commentaries of Ewald, Harrisall, Delich. Delich was kind of a... He's a weirdo, okay? And Conant will find no startling novelty in the departures of this paraphrase from the accepted version. In other words, it's got the same meaning, okay? But it's closer to the original because they're going to count the syllables. The original has been studied only through these and other authors, and no change has been adopted which is not justified with weighty arguments by one or more of them. Where equally good authorities disagree, the ground of choice among them has been furnished by the context. In other words, just the Bible, please. We're looking at the Bible, and where there's a dispute, the Bible is right and everybody else is wrong. That's exactly the kind of thing that Christ was predicting would happen. That's exactly the point of the timeline in Matthew 24 and 25. The Bible we all take for granted today has been fought over for centuries. And one of the things that we lost still is the meter. But they didn't lose it. This is 1878. 1640 now to 1878, no longer 1839. And it's in the book of Job, no longer just the Psalms. While the paraphrase is chiefly to be judged as an attempt to reproduce the thoughts and arguments of the original, it may possibly serve also to convey a juster conception of the poetry. Much of the, con the current talk about the sublimity of Job is based on vague imprecisions formed without analysis. For, for instance, a famous passage in the 39th chapter strikes the meat of the war horse clothed with thunder, a phrase which is often quoted with admiration, but is merely, you know, was it a, mi a monstrous, a, a sonorous mistranslation? The notion of noise is inseparable from the word thunder, while the notion of thunderous noise has nothing whatsoever to do with the name of the charger. In other words, you don't have a thunderous mane. There's no such thing as a thunderous mane. It doesn't make any noise, the mane of the horse. Okay? Clothed with thunder. A horse clothed with thunder. Well, what's the clothing? The mane of the horse. So what they're trying to do is take away the sonorous translation 
and have it make sense. Okay, now, then he goes into the shaking of the mane, which is the original, indicates a shaking and inspires awe in the beholder, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so now let's have a look at what his paraphrase is. The changes in translation are amply discussed and vindicated that by was paraphrased briefly based on its words referred to an explanation. German translations, not being revisions, but free original versions, give the many passages interpretation. So he's co saying, look, we compared the original, we compared the German, and we compared the revised version in English. Okay? So he's basically defending the translation by saying, look, I did my homework with respect to the other hoary heads and what they had to say the words meant. Okay? I want to get to the actual translation. I don't want the introductory note. I just want to look at the text. Take me to the text. Book of Job. Okay, now you're telling me about the book of Job. I want to see the translation, please. This is the commentary part. Book of Job is a historical picture. Yes, yeah, so I know that. Give me the text. Where's the translation? Ugh. You know, one thing that was bad about the 19th century is they would talk and talk and talk forever and never really say anything. They felt it was more majestic to multiply words. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, boy. There's no table of contents. That's another flaw that was often in 19th century literature. They didn't think that you'd care to have a table of contents. Okay, well, I'm going to find it. Okay, this looks like it's supposed to be the book of Job, but i got to stop here because I'm coughing too much. <coughs> 